Good evening, everyone. What a lively crowd. I hope you're still as energetic at the end of this um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. My name's Catherine Carney Feldman. I'm on the Conservation Commission board. And this is one of our many presentations from the Conservation Speaker Series. Um, I am really thrilled because the lady that is going to be doing this presentation, we've been trying to get her for some time, and she's come from New Hampshire. And uh, I know the presentation is great because I've had some friends that have seen it, and they told me it was great. And because it was, we were going to get her down here. So I would like you to welcome Sarah Kuchesny, and she's going to be doing The Secret Life of the Gulls of Appledore. Sarah? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try and keep myself from being too animated and stay by this microphone. Um, before I get started, I would like to, I mean, I'm the one in front of the room right now, but I would like to call attention to my sister and collaborator in the back, at the computer back there. Um, that is Mary Everett, and she's not only my sister, she's also my colleague, and she and I jointly run the research project on the Gulls of Appledore, and both of us admit neither one of us could do it alone, so it's very much a 50-50 endeavor. No one would wanna do this job alone. Um, um, so, and as we go through, um, I want to welcome you to ask any questions as they occur to you, because it always bothered me when I'd be at a talk and I'd be like, oh, I wonder about that. And they'd be like, hold your questions till the end. And I'd be like, I'm not going to remember by the end, or it won't seem relevant. So please just throw your hand up and I will take the question at the time and I will try to remember to repeat the question for the benefit of everyone, including the folks who may be viewing this, because this is being recorded, much to my delight. Um, now I'm like warm. This room is very unpredictable in its <laughs> thermodynamics. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out, and it's up there for you, um, is that we run this project out of Northern Essex Community College. We have campuses in Lawrence and Haverhill, Massachusetts. And we're quite proud of that. Uh, that's where I teach. I teach biology and chemistry. And community colleges don't often have the opportunity to offer research activities to their students. And we have many students that have come through this program, have been able to come out to the island with us um, and participate in field biology and ecology research. And they are often a population who is overlooked and doesn't get opportunities like that often. So we're really proud of that. And we're grateful to all the donors that have made it possible, because it's not a cheap endeavor. Um, and that is my first mention of money. It won't be my last mention of money. There will be a passing of the helmet later on in the evening um, as we try to garner any donations that we possibly can to make this work continue. All right, I'm going to try to operate this high-tech machinery. Let's see if we can do this. Do it! Yeah, it's so the the bottom arrow moves forward, the top arrow moves it back. Neither one wants to do anything. Mary, would you mind advancing the slide? Oh. It was working earlier, so I think it. Okay. And if this is the worst problem we have tonight, we're in good shape. All right, you want to advance, Mary? Okay, so some of you may already be familiar with um, where Appledore is located, but in case you're not, um, we have our location. We are one of the Isles of Shoals off the coast of New Hampshire slash Maine. There's a lot of turfiness about that. Um, Appledore is the topmost island there, the big kind of tubby looking one. We say that with great affection. Um, and it's actually part of Maine. So the state line between Maine and New Hampshire runs right through the Isles of Shoals. So if you've ever been to or heard of Star Island, that's actually in New Hampshire, whereas we are in Maine. So that's where we do all of our research. Um, you will see that you have an, a chance to encounter our banded birds all over New England and beyond, but Appledore Island is where they breed. So they're there for a very brief period of time raising their babies, and we go out there and spend as much time with them as we can, um, trying to do research with them during that brief period of time where they are breeding. Go ahead, Mary. So this is kind of the scene on Appledore. Um, it's really pretty cool. When people get out there, it often has not occurred to them. You know, you think of a bird in a nest, you picture it on a shelf somewhere, or in a tree, or some elevated position. Uh, but like many other seabirds, gulls nest right on the ground. And they can get away with this because it's an island. So there's typically not any land-based predators that are going to eat them or their babies. So they'll just build a nest right out in the open. So the moment you set foot on Appledore Island, you're surrounded by these gulls just dotting the whole place, just hanging out there. Um, and we've got... So the uppermost picture, we've got two different species of gulls that breed on the island. Um, the one in the top picture is 
let, some of you may have encountered them. They're, they're not an uncommon gull, but they're not the typical one you see in the Wendy's parking lot or at the beach so much. That is the great blackback gull in the top one. Um, we are very proud to point out that it is the largest gull species in the world, and we handle it. So that's those guys. Um, and then this, the, the bottom picture here, I've, oh, maybe I'll use this. I'm used to like jumping around a lot. Um, does that thing do it? It's the sunshine thing, right? Yeah. Are they putting it the wrong way? There we go. All right, so this is what we see a little bit later in the season. Here's the little baby, and they are just the cutest, most adorable fuzzballs you've ever seen. Um, but you could imagine that they're quite vulnerable. So they're nesting just out in the open on the ground, um, and hopefully there aren't any land-based predators. But a great blackback gull is a pretty big predator himself, so there can be some carnage on the island. Um, and then you can get a little bit of a sense, this map over here on the left side, Mary does all of our GIS and mapping stuff. I don't even understand what most of those words mean. Um, so I'm very fortunate that she knows how to do these things. And um, what she's got up there is every blue dot you see is a herring gull nest. Um, so that's, you know, you'd see just a bird sitting on the ground. And so you can get a sense of, in some places like over here, how densely packed those blue dots are. You really can't step two feet without there being a nest right in front of you. So it's, it's difficult going in those areas of the colony. Um, and then the red dots are all the great blackback gulls. So as you can get a sense from that map, Appledore is mostly a herring gull island. Um, the great blackbacks are larger and more intimidating, but the herring gulls are definitely more numerous. And the other thing you can get a sense of, Appledore is a working college campus. So there's undergraduates taking classes, and all these little black kind of um, squares and rectangles here, that's the campus itself. And you can see that the trails that run between the buildings, there are birds nesting all along those trails. So the students very rapidly get you, they arrive on the island, they're like, whoa, this is not what I expected. I came to take a class about marine mammals, and everywhere I step are these birds. Um, so we very much live right alongside them. Appledore is pretty unusual in that our gulls are quite habituated to humans because they have to be. They're living right next to a trail where college students are walking back and forth to the dining hall all day. Um, so they are not always happy with our presence, but they do tolerate us, which I appreciate about them very much. All right, I went backwards. It's working though. This is, this is promising. All right, so um, just in, this, in the sense of I want to give credit to those who came before us in establishing this project. We think our project is special in a lot of ways, but it actually had its origins back in the early 2000s. Um, Julie Ellis over here, and you can see we decided we should band Julie because she had done enough <laughs> banding of gulls herself and we wanted to put her through her paces. Um, so we actually, unbeknownst to her, had a plan. We captured her one day and we wrapped her in a sheet because when we catch the birds, we put them in a bag to restrain them and we hung her upside down to simulate the weighing step and then we placed bands on her legs. She was a bit shaken after the experience, but she did tolerate it fairly well. Uh, and she actually started the work on Appledore as part of her PhD thesis. And typical of a PhD, it was fairly limited in time, although PhDs will tell you it does not feel limited in time. But she wanted to look at how are the gulls influencing the land-based environment? Like, are they carrying nutrients from the ocean up onto the land, impacting the plants and other aspects of the habitat? Which is really cool, but was never meant to be a long-term study. It was just meant to run the course of her PhD, and then she walks away from the island, and that's that. And she decided not to, to our great fortune. She decided that she was curious about these birds, and she thought, what if we just started putting bands on them and just seeing where they go and what they're up to? And so she started doing that in 2005, and we haven't let up on that effort since, which is pretty unusual, because most science gets done in accordance with someone's grant. So it runs maybe four or five years, and then the money's done, or the project's over, and we move on. So our project, having been following this population of gulls since 2004, 2005, we're now building up whole families and generations of birds and where they spend their time and who they hang out with and grandchildren of this gull and great-grandchildren of this gull, which is pretty spectacular. Um, so we were very fortunate that she entrusted this project to us when she moved on to other things within the last couple of years. And so we've been kind of trying to get our feet under us in terms of trying to figure out where we want to take the project next, but continuing to carry that thread through. The other cool thing about our project is that nobody gets paid, which isn't really that cool when you're one of the people not getting paid. Um, but we run it completely with volunteers. So you can see in this picture here, Bill Clark, this guy right here, he has been extraordinary, has been with the project since the very beginning on a volunteer basis and has given like more than a full-time job's worth of time to this thing. He just announced to us this year that he would like to retire from his formal environment, environment involvement in the project um, and we're just super grateful. So I'm glad that he's in there and I got to mention him again. So now Mary and I are running it. 
Um, and we're trying to do it justice because there have been some extraordinary people that have worked on it. So basically what I want to talk about now is kind of perceptions of gulls throughout the Gulf of Maine, not just the Gulf of Maine, but pretty much universally. Um, even my own college, when they were promoting this talk, made some derisive remark about like dirty scavengers. And I was like, excuse me, like what? What are you talking about? And they were like, well, it's hard to refute. They are dirty scavengers. I'm like, thank you, Northern Essex Community College, for helping the cause. But I think there is a perception that, you know, gulls are pests, they're in my face, they're stealing my food. Um, last year, this guy kicked a gull up in Hampton. It was, they actually went after him for it, which I did appreciate. Um, but the bird was bothering him and tried to take his burger. So he started kicking it and trying to kill it or something. And it was just this whole tone that was like, well, they're annoying and they're in my face and I hate them and they're dirty and they're gross. Uh, and so that's the perception. You know, people go to the beach and they're like, okay, here's this bird that is trying to raid my cooler. Um, Dave Adrian is actually here tonight. Many of his pe pictures are featured in this presentation. He's a chronic gull spotter for us and he has caught them in the act of a great many things. So I cannot deny that they show up at beaches and they do steal food. And sometimes they go places like dumps and they eat the food there. So certainly if we're just saying, you know, do gulls ever scavenge food? Do they ever steal food from people? Yes, absolutely they do. We've all seen that happen. But I think the question that we are interested in looking at is, is that all they do? And is that what all gulls do? And can we just say, well, that's how they make a living? Which would be puzzling because humans haven't been around since the dawn of time. So what exactly were they doing before we showed up with our coolers? So that's what we're kind of trying to get at. Um, Wow, that's funny. Those colors are totally different than they are on my screen, but I hope you can kind of see. So the perception is definitely that gulls are common, they are annoying, there are too many of them, they're probably overpopulated, they're in the same grouping as pigeons and rats and things that we try to exterminate. So the question we want to raise here and, and the issue we want to point to is whether or not that's actually true. Like, do we actually have too many gulls? Are they pests? Should we be controlling them? Or should we be a little more cautious about that. So this, this is another benefit of having studied these birds on this island for many years. Um, there have been students on this island participating in this gull research since the 90s. You, know, you can see from this graph. And every year, um, those students will go, different groups of students every year, so this has been a major group effort. They go out to a certain subset of the, the island, the same place every year, and the students walk that same area and they count how many nests there are of each species. So it's basically a, a census of a, a sub colony on the island and we track that over time. So what you can see here, it's a little bit hard with these colors, um, but the upper lines here, these are the herring gull numbers and then the lower ones are the great blackback numbers. So again, you can see Appledore is a herring gull island primarily with great blackbacks kind of edging in at the sides. Um, and back in the 90s and 2000s, so this is number of nests. So every nest has two adults on it, plus their babies, and they can have as many as three babies. So you can see where like, we're up you know, towards 500 herring gull nests. That's 1,000 adult birds, plus all their offspring. It's a, it apparently was just a cacophony. Like the island was just unreal at that point. I was not out there at the time. I can't even imagine. So it was. Those gulls were doing very, very well. Um, you can see the, the blackbacks were far less in terms of their population, and they were sort of just kind of trucking along. The herring gulls were, you could argue that they were really starting to boom. Their population seemed to be on the up and up. Um, and then the graph gets a little strange, because we sort of just drop off a cliff here and the line doesn't continue. But what you really want to focus on is we go from this little square dot here showing how many herring gulls there are to this one. So there was a massive population crash. and. Basically, this actually qualified as what we would call a colony collapse, like a colony failure. And what had happened that year, Julie Ellis was out at the time, um, they were noticing a lot of disturbance in the colony, something was up, and they started to hear some strange sounds in one of the buildings on campus. And somebody took a camera and put it up where they could hear the sounds and took a picture and brought it down and they saw it was a whole family of raccoons living in the building. So they were like, well, that would explain that. So these raccoons, we don't know how they got there. Sometimes people do just bring raccoons out and dump them on the islands, who knows why. Sometimes deliberately to kill the gulls because people don't like gulls. We don't know exactly how those raccoons got there. Um, but it was a catastrophe for the colony that year. So they trapped the raccoons, they removed them, took them off the mainland. I'm sure they're living on a farm happily somewhere now. Um, and the assumption was, okay, that was a bad year, but next year, 
gulls live a long time. They can live 30, 40 years. They'll be back next year and they'll have babies then. But what you can see, and this, was, this is strange, they, this was their last good year, the raccoons hit, we dropped down to here, and then here's the herring gull line ever since then. It's just kind of been like limping along. So what we don't know is where did those gulls go? I mean, they live a long time. They might have just said, you know what, this is a bad news neighborhood. Terrible things happen here. This is no place to raise children. Let's move on. But we don't know. And unfortunately, at that point, the gulls were not banded. So we can't look around on other islands and say, OK, where'd that guy go? You know, where, where's, that per where's that gull raising its children now? We just know that our colony on Appledore never recovered from that event. So it was really neat. I mean, it's a terrible story, but the paper that was written up about it was pointing to the idea that you wouldn't think a one-time event like that, where a predator got on the island and caused a major ruckus, it, that predator, those raccoons, did not kill adult gulls. So it's not as though those birds were dead and so they never came back. The adults all survived. They just never looked at Appledore the same way again, and they moved on. And we don't know if they're on other islands or not. So we're now dealing with a, a very different reality. Um, you can also see that the impact on the blackbacks was quite different. So they also took a big hit that year. Their babies and eggs were killed by the raccoon in great numbers as well. But they came closer to rebounding to their former numbers. And now, you know, we're kind of trucking along here, and you can see, we'll talk a little bit about the most recent years. Um, it looks like the past few years we've been on sort of a gradual downtrend. So this is consistent with what we see across the Gulf of Maine, that gull populations are in trouble. Um, this is not just Appledore. When we talk to our colleagues on other colonies, they're seeing this overall decline. So that idea that gulls are ubiquitous, they're annoying, there's too many of them, they're overpopulated, they feed on our garbage, and that's why there's so many, it's not borne out by the data. Whatever's going on with them, we're not entirely sure. We're trying to piece it together, and we'll talk about a little bit of that. Um, but this is the story. It's, they're, they're on the, the, the downward trend. So this gets to why. We're like, OK, what's going on with these guys? And you know, I, I'm not going to deny their reputation for being clever. I mean, if there are easy ways to make a living, who's not going to choose an easy way to make a living? So sure enough, if you go to a landfill, you'll find gulls there. If you are on a fishing vessel or a lobster boat, you'll find gulls following you. There are no dummies. Um, and so there's been a lot of people that have sort of argued, OK, well, if we know that gulls have come to rely on human-generated food sources, like garbage, like fishery discards, things like that, is maybe part of the reason we're seeing this decline in gull populations kind of just a natural correction? Because maybe we did build their populations up artificially high by making all this food available to them. So back through the 70s and 80s, we used to have a lot more landfills that were just open trash pits. And so the gulls could, it was just a smorgasbord. And since then, more and more of those landfills have been capped and covered over. So there's been some people that have argued that maybe the numbers that we saw of gulls in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when gull populations peaked throughout the Gulf of Maine, Maybe that was artificial, and that was too many gulls. The problem is we have no idea what the baseline should have been. We don't know how many gulls is too many gulls. We don't know what's a natural kind of carrying capacity, um, so we can't be sure. We do have some sense that when these things happen, when landfills close and when fisheries close, it does have an impact on them. And I'm going to show you um, just briefly one study that was a really clever way of looking at that. But we also can't rule out like seabirds in general are on the decline, some of them catastrophically so. And a lot of them are seabirds that, that can't rely on landfills or fisheries. They're much more specialized, something like a tern that has to fish for a living. If we knock out their prey base and those fish aren't available anymore, the tern population is going to suffer. And we think that maybe the gulls are getting hit from all sides. You know, If they were relying on landfills and landfills are closing, if they were following fishing boats and there's not as much of that anymore, and with climate change and overfishing, we've also hit them on all their natural food sources. They may be just under these multiple pressures, and we're seeing that in this consistent decline. So a really, OK, now I've lost my ability. I seem to intermittently have the capacity. Mary's going to hit it for me. I just know it. There we go. 
All right, so this was a, an almost an inadvertent research study that was done in Canada. Because in Canada, um, they had a really robust cod and salmon fishery going on in the eastern, the Maritimes, basically, in Canada. Uh, and then as of 1992, they realized that those fisheries were collapsing. And if they didn't intervene aggressively, then they might drive those species completely to extinction. So they actually went aggressively and declared a complete moratorium on ground fishing. So you could no longer fish for cod, you could no longer fish for salmon. So that the whole fleet in eastern Canada as of 1992 was just stuck in the harbor, you're not going fishing, that's it. So these scientists were like, well, here's a chance for us to look at what the impacts are on seabirds when you take that pressure off completely. And they were actually interested in more than just gulls. So they were saying, all right, when a fishing vessel goes out, it could have more than one potential impact on birds. If you are a diving bird, like this little icon that's showing a mur here, or muir, depending on how you want to pronounce it, I have no idea. Um, here's this diving bird, and they are pursuit divers. So they will swim after fish underwater and catch them underwater and then manipulate them and eat them. And those kinds of birds are very susceptible to getting tangled up in fishing nets. So the fishing vessels for them are a death trap, because they'll go chasing a fish and they don't see this net that's basically invisible, and they get stuck in it and they drown. So there were just like untold numbers of these birds getting entangled in these fishing nets. So these researchers thought, all right, well, then if there's no more fishing for cod and salmon, this particular kind of fishing called gill net fishing, um, then we should see those populations of seabirds do better because we're taking that pressure off of them and they should, their populations should increase. And then their secondary hypothesis was, and if it's true that gulls have been relying very heavily on like old bait and stuff like that that fishermen throw overboard, then once there's no more fishermen in those waters, the gulls should do worse. And sure enough, that's what they found. So they've got this little dotted line here that kind of shows, so if there were a dot on the dotted line, it would mean there's no impact on these birds. So if you see like these blue lines up here, um, that is, there's various different species of these diving birds, so things like puffins and razorbills, they all kind of fish that way. Um, and each one of those dots is one of those species, and you can see they're all above this dotted line, so that shows that their populations increased after the, the fishing vessels were, were halted and kept in the harbor. And then down here are the gull species. So what they're seeing down here is the opposite effect. You know, once there were no longer fishing vessels going out, the gull populations declined, so they took a hit. And it's twofold reason. The gulls rely on those foods coming off those fishing vessels, and they don't fish like this. They don't swim underwater. If you've ever seen a gull try to catch a fish or something, it's comical. It's almost like if you've ever seen a fox jump for prey under the snow, where they just like jump straight up and go head first into the snow, and then they just kind of puff down there, and then maybe they come up with a mouse. That's how gulls go fishing. They'll fly up into the air, and then they'll kind of drop down into the water, and they can get about six inches underwater, and if they didn't catch whatever it was, then that's too bad. So they're not swimming divers. Um, so they're basically just loitering around these fishing boats waiting for handouts. So they don't get caught in gill nets. So fishing vessels for them were 100% a plus. And when we took the fishing vessels away, they suffered. The MERS were doing kind of poorly with all those gill nets in the water. You take the gill nets out of the water and they can fish more freely and the fishing vessels aren't taking so many fish out of the water. So when we look at things like, well, what impact does this have on seabirds? It's pretty hard to say that across the board. Depending on what kind of seabird you are, it might be a plus or a minus. So this is just kind of showing the same thing. This is the population incline for those diving birds. So this one is for the common myrrh. And you can see that 1992 was when they put the moratorium into place. Before that, um, both the herring gull populations and the myrrhs, the myrrhs had been actually kind of creeping up. So some other conservation measures had been put into place. And they were like kind of doing all right. And then they stopped fishing. And the myrrhs just took off. Their populations just skyrocketed. But the herring gulls, <laughs> didn't do so well. So it depends on what kind of seabird you are. And that, but w this the kind of like unnatural experiment that they took advantage of did give us some pretty substantial evidence that human food sources are very important to gulls. And when you take away a human food source, their populations can decline. It still doesn't tell us what the baseline was. So we still don't know if we've overshot that. And this is now an unusually low number of gulls, or if we're still headed down to where we should be. Um, but these consistent declines, decade on decade, have gotten to the point where most scientists that are working with these gulls are pretty alarmed about it. It does not seem likely that this is a natural course correction at this point. Oh, that worked. Um, so this is hot off the presses. Um, this is what's going on on our colony on Appledore this year. 
So you saw from the census data that we've been kind of watching a slow kind of ticking down of our total numbers of nests on Appledore. And this year has been really brutal. Um, we got out there in May to start our work and gulls die on the colony, that happens. But usually adult breeding gulls are in pretty good shape because they don't have to breed in any given year. So if you have a gull that just didn't have a good year, is kind of skinny and kind of marginal, they can take a year off and you just won't see them. They just won't show up that year. These were gulls that had shown up, built a nest, found a mate, laid some eggs, apparently were feeling good up to that point. And in some cases we were finding them dead, slumped over on their nests. So something was killing them very acutely. Um, in this picture, which Mary took of me, which I absolutely love because it's creepy as all get out. Um, this is, we're in the colony here, this is me, and this is a dead gull that I'm carrying. Um, and we brought that back to do a dissection on it. That bird, we actually, uh, one of our volunteers had found that bird dragging itself around by its wings. It couldn't use its legs. And we were seeing that pretty commonly. And that's not, usually when they die, they just get weaker and then they kind of go someplace and hide and die. These birds were showing signs of paralysis. So we collected several of them. I know it's very tiny, but I wanted to put it up here to remind myself. Um, this is a notice that went out to all these local towns, including Ipswich, Newbury, um, Rockport, uh, warning everybody about paralytic shellfish poisoning, and please don't eat any of the shellfish. Sadly, the gulls cannot read those notices, so the ones that rely heavily on shellfish most likely are the ones we were finding dead. So that is our presumptive diagnosis right now, that the adult gulls that were otherwise headed into the breeding year looking great got acute cases of shellfish poisoning um, from a dinoflagellate, so one of these basically red tide events, uh, and that's what they were dying from. And unfortunately, if one of the parents dies, so in gulls, both parents contribute equally to incubating the eggs. They both sit equally on them to keep them warm. And then once the eggs hatch, both parents contribute equally to feeding the babies. And if one parent dies, there is no way for the other one to keep up. So if one gull parent dies, that whole family is done for the year. That other mate may have a chance next year or the year after that, but that year's reproductive effort is over. Um, and we, th I think through the end of May, this was like a 300% increase in what we normally see for adults dying. So we usually see, what was it, like 900? Yeah, so as we went through the season, we were seeing more and more of these, uh, and it was really, it was deeply troubling for us to see. We just don't usually see that. So uh, later on in the season, we actually go around and we count every single nest on the island, so we'll have a better sense of exactly how many. And then we also um, look at how many uh, babies fledged and how, how many eggs hatched and all that stuff. And we are anticipating that it was a pretty terrible year for this colony. And as you saw from the year where the raccoon hit, we don't know how well they'll recover from that. We don't know how they respond to an event like that. If, if the ones that survive are just going to be like, you know what, that is a horrible place. Don't ever go there. So we don't know. And it just had this feeling of almost like witnessing the death of a colony. I mean, I can't put it any other way. So we're hopeful that they will come back from this. But in a long-lived seabird, a bird that has lived to adulthood and successful breeding is a treasured member of the population. I mean, you can't replace them very easily. They're not like a, a quick breeding species like a rat or a mouse. You know, they live a few months and that's it, and they have a bunch of babies and goodbye. These guys can live 40 years. So if you kill one of them with paralytic shellfish poisoning, I mean, that's potentially a lost 20, 30 years of breeding because they breed all the way through those long lives. So it is concerning for the health of the colony that that many breeding adults died. It's one thing when something affects the fledglings, they're kind of expendable, but these guys, it's, it's scary. Um, so the, the larger theme of what we're looking at, because that, I mean, again, when you look at that, we know that not every gull eats shellfish. So it's not surprising that we had some birds dying acutely from this red tide and others that were like, la, 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 I'm fine, it's no big deal. Because what we found, the way ecology used to kind of work, the way most of biology used to work and still does, is you get a bunch of animals or plants or whatever you're studying and you measure something about them and then you just figure, take the average and that tells you what that species is like. You know, and we do that in humans too. Like take a bunch of people, study them and say, the average person lost five pounds on this diet. So yeah, that's what happens. And for a long time, that's how people treated gulls. And they just figured, okay, well, you'll often see the phrase um, a generalist seabird um, where people will say, well, gulls are pretty adaptable. They'll eat anything. They'll eat garbage. They'll eat rats. They'll eat birds. They'll eat shellfish. They'll eat fish. 
Um, and it was treated as though every gull was very flexible and would eat just about anything. It was a total omnivore. And what we've been kind of focusing on over time is, is that true? Or do individual birds develop their own habits and their own preferences so that you have some gulls that are fish eaters, some gulls that are landfill birds, some gulls that exclusively eat shellfish. And sure enough, that has turned out to be the case. Um, so I've got very small text up in the left just to remind me. Um, that, I think, says getting to the bottom of gulls' attitude problem. And it was talking about uh, this reputation that gulls have for beating up on other birds or for doing things like eating terns. So I'm actually wearing my turn band bracelet this evening. Um, we did find, so people ask us about that a lot because Appledore is right next door to an island that houses a tern colony and the gulls are not allowed to nest there. If they try to nest there, they are unceremoniously escorted off the island. But there's a lot of people that are nervous about that because they're like, okay, we've got these terns nesting basically cheek by jowl with the gulls that nest on the next island and gulls, you'd think logically, would just come over to the turn island and just mow down all those babies, just eat them all up. And it turns out, turns out, it's terrible, there's so many puns involved in this, but we don't see that a whole lot. So we have for many years collected the regurgitated, sort of like an owl pellet, gulls cough up something similar and you can dissect it and see what they've eaten. And we didn't typically see a lot of turn bones or turn feathers in there. So it didn't seem like a lot of gulls were using that resource, even though you might think it was easy pickings. Um, this bracelet is made almost exclusively out of bands that were placed on turns, and those turns were then eaten by one very particular gull who developed a taste for baby turns. And so people would ask us that. They're like, well, why don't more of them do it? If you've ever visited a turn colony, it's like the worst thing that could ever happen to you. It's like they all rise up in a mass at the threat of a predator and they start hitting you on the head with their little sharp beaks. And it's like, oh my God, my brain's rattling. So if you're a gull and you see all those lovely, delicious, tasty baby turns, you have to run that gauntlet. So it seems like most gulls are like, yeah, I mean, they do look tasty, but no thanks. The flying darts thing is a bit much for me. And then this one gull had somehow perfected some sort of technique. No one ever saw him do it. So we don't know how he did it. We don't know if he's male or female either. But would get into the colony, munch down a bunch of baby turns, and then head back to Appledore. And then he would yak up the bits he couldn't digest, including these many bands from these baby turns. But it was very limited. So in talking with the people that run the turn colony, they're always looking for ways to protect their turns. And they have endangered species of turns on that island, so I don't blame them. And so they, I appreciate this about them. They're like, well, if you could identify which gull it is, then we would kill just that gull. <laughs> because they don't want to just go out willy-nilly and just start killing gulls. Gulls aren't doing well either. And we can't assume that they all eat turns, because apparently they don't. Do you have a question? You found that gull when you relocated him mm -hmm. So the question was, if we did find the gull that was eating the terns and tried to relocate it, would it find its way back? Um, it definitely would. So that's, yeah, I mean, they, ha and that's what we're finding with their personalities and their habits. This, this is ingrained. So that bird developed this technique that was very successful. That's how he knows to make a living. And Appledore is his breeding island. So he'd be back there every year to breed, even if we tried to take him someplace else. And that's the unfortunate thing. They're really, the gulls are only on Appledore during this brief season, but the terns are also only on their island for a brief season. So you get this little overlap. So we ended up, the problem was solved for us because we could never find this gull. Like this was like the trickiest gull on earth. All we ever found from this gull was the pile of stuff it yacked up. And it always yacked things up at the same location. So two years in a row, we went out there to the vomitorium and just collected all these little bits. And we were like, where is this guy? And we never found him. So we could truthfully go to the, the woman who runs the turn colony and say, I'm sorry, we'd take him out for you if we could, but we couldn't find him. So we were kind of pleased with that. But the, I mean, the other good news about that is she doesn't have to worry about killing every gull she sees. Because it seems like it's hard to make a living that way, or more gulls would do it. So that's what we're kind of interested in is how do these gulls decide, well, I'm going to specialize in this. I'm going to be a turn eater, and that's what I'm going to get good at. And what we found, so this study down here was done actually in Europe um, and was looking at herring gulls and was looking at exactly that question of how do they decide, because they have found the same thing, that certain gulls specialize in eating mussels and clams in the intertidal. Others make a living off of baby turns at least part of the year. Others go to the landfill every day and make a living there. Some go to the beach and eat your picnic. And they were kind of looking at, well, what consequences does that have for these birds? Like, is it, is it good to make a living off of clams, or is it better to make a living off the landfill? 
And what they found in their system is that most herring gulls actually do eat mostly clams, at least on their colony over in Europe. Um, so this, this and, and Europe has, especially Britain, has a major problem with gulls just stealing people's food all the time, which I find hilarious. So their like, impression over there is like all gulls are stealing food all the time. They take my ice cream. It's terrible. But it turns out most of them actually you never see. Most of these herring gulls are out on the tide flats when it's low tide. You never see them. They're eating razor clams and things like that. And that's the most common way for a herring gull to make a living. So their question was, is that a good way to make a living? Like, do you get a lot of calories from shellfish and clams and things like that? Um, it turns out you don't. So it's a hard way to make a living. You basically got to walk all day long and eat clams all day long to get enough calories to keep yourself going. And so other gulls had made a different choice. They're like, you know what? I'm not going to do that because you got to just walk around all day and eat clams, and that's all you do. But the trade-off is the clams are nearby because the clams are in the tide flats right next to your colony. Other gulls make a different calculation and will fly like 20, 30 kilometers to like farmland or to a landfill and they'll make a living there. And the trade-off there is it's actually kind of hard to get good food items in a landfill because most of it is trash. So they have to pick through and they will find some good morsels. They'll find some really calorie rich food there, but it's rare. So each bird is kind of making its own choices. You know, do I want to fly 40 kilometers to the landfill where I'll hopefully find some really choice morsels? Or do I want to just, you know, roll out of bed and go to the tide flats and eat clams all day? So they're each making their own decisions. And it turns out we would have thought, like, oh, they'll all just eat anything. They don't. They develop their own habits. And they'll consistently go to the same places every day. And they get good at what they do. So if you're a crab-eating gull, you probably just eat crabs. We have gulls on our island that really just exclusively fish for a living. They go out to sea. No one ever sees them. They come back, and when they yak up their meal, it's like a mackerel like this big. It like, takes up their whole body. And we're like, wow, that's how you make your living. And that's what they specialize in. They are fishing gulls. They don't go to the landfill. You will never see them at the beach. So when you see birds at the beach, you're probably seeing the same birds over and over again who are used to you. Yeah, they're like, hi. What's, and I'm going to share with you like some stories of some of those guys. Um, so that's our question here is like, are you seeing the same bird every time? Because of course, you know, when you go there and you're like, I think that's the same bird. But they all kind of look the same to us. So the only way to make sure is we put these special bracelets on them. Um, and I actually have a couple of them that I'll hand around so you guys can get a sense of how big they are. Um, people who have worked with songbird banders, they'll often be like, yeah, yeah, I've banded birds. I'm like, yeah, you've banded birds? You ever banded a gull? And they're like, oh, how different could it be? And then we show them the bands, and they're like, so I'll hand these around. I've got a, um, sorry, I won't leave the microphone. Um, I've got a blackback band that was actually on a bird for a very long time, so it got very worn, and we had to replace it. And then we have a green, the green one is the herring gull band. So you can get a little bit of a sense of the size differential. And you can also get a sense that the black one that was on a great blackback for a long time, it's very light. So, I mean, you'll see what they're actually wearing on their legs. So I'll pass those around. So, um, yeah, the question was, how do we catch the birds? It depends on whether we're talking about an adult gull or a baby. The adult gulls, they are very driven to get back on the nest if you disturb them because they want to incubate those eggs. So we go when they have eggs, and we have a sophisticated trap that I will try to explain to you, but it's very sophisticated. Uh, it is basically a rebar frame covered in chicken wire, kind of box-shaped, that we prop up on a stick, and there's a string tied to the stick <laughs> that leads off into the shrubbery. And when the gull goes under the box and sits on the eggs, we pull the string, and the box falls on it. And then we run out and catch it, and that's science. So, um, and that relies on the fact that they are very, like, you can see them, like, they'll look at the box and be like, I don't trust that, but those, mm, okay, yes, I will do it. And some of them actually don't care. They're just like, okay, there's a box in my house. Mm -hmm. And they'll go sit down. And then, again, same theme of, like, each gull is individual. Some of them will never go into a trap. They will just look at the trap, and then they'll look at you, and they'll look at the trap, and they're like, I get it. I, I get it. I see what you're doing here. I will die before I go back under there. So there are birds we've been trying to trap for years that are like, nope, not doing it. I remember you from last year. Get away from me. So it depends on the bird. Some of them are like, yeah, that's fine. So that's how we catch the adults. Um, the babies, it's sort of like catching chickens in a barnyard. They can't fly yet. So we just bring a big team of undergraduates, and we send them out there and tell them to catch them. And then we stand back and grin. Um, so we can get a lot of them that way.
So um, this is what we do. Once we have them, we place one of these big bands on them that has like the letter, the number letter code. And those are extremely expensive. Each one costs six bucks a piece, which if you're banding hundreds of birds, you can see that adds up quick. But the advantage is you can see them. So if you're at the beach and that bird is stealing your lunch, you can be like, hey, that was 2R2 stealing my lunch. We also place a federally issued metal band that's you know common, like the feds require that, but the numbers are so tiny that you would have no chance of reading them. So these you can sometimes read with the naked eye. You can certainly read them with binoculars. So we've made this investment in trying to get as many public reports of our birds as possible and to make it as easy as possible for any member of the public to participate, which I'm hoping you all will be like super excited to go out and look for these bands. Uh, but this is very labor intensive. It's hard to do. So the, the helmet we're going to pass around for donations is the same helmet that Franciel is wearing in the top frame. Um, the gulls are, I don't like it when people call them aggressive because if someone came in my house and grabbed my children and abducted them, I think my response would be totally justified if I ran out and tried to beat that person on the head. So that's what we're up against, is when we're messing around with their offspring, they very appropriately try to fend us off. So they will come down, they will fly up above us, and then drop down and usually hit us with their knuckles. Um, and we had one student hit by a black back that had a concussion that was so bad she had to be evacuated from the island. So now we're like, everybody's in helmets all the time. We're going to be very careful. Sometimes they fly down and bite you, too, which was a new thing this year. So they're always getting inventive. Um, so we have to be careful because we want to keep our people safe. And then every bird, it takes a while to process them. So we take blood from them so that we can do um, DNA determination of whether they're male or female. And we sometimes take some feather samples. So we try to get as much as possible for as many scientists as possible when we have the bird in the hand. So it takes a while. But the benefit is then we send that bird out into the world and people hopefully see it many times and we can get kind of a life history on it. Um, so I told you about this. That's our trap. So there's the box. There's a bird that's like kind of like, uh, I don't know. And then the youngsters are a lot easier. You just pick them up because they're fluffy and cute and they can't really bite you that hard. Um, so the, the trade-off we're always making is to catch an adult bird, it takes a while. You got to set the trap. You got to wait for them. Some of them aren't interested. Um, so we don't catch a lot of adults in a given year. But the advantage is once you've got an adult bird that was breeding, banded, there's like an 80% plus chance that that bird will live through the year and will be back again next year. So you commonly see these birds again and again. The youngsters don't have a very high survival rate, so we can put these expensive bands on them and most of them will never be seen again. They won't even live to leave the island. So it's kind of the balance where we're like, well, we want... We like banding the babies because you know exactly how old they are. Because that way it's like, well, I know you were like not even a year old when I put the band on you. So if I see you 20 years from now, you're 20. With the adults, all we know about that bird in that left-hand picture is that bird is at least four years old. It takes them four years to get to their fully adult plumage, but we can't say anything more than that. So it could be 24, it could be 34, it could be just four. So we don't know. So if we wanted to answer any questions about that are age-related, we really need to ban them as babies. But you know, so that's the trade-off. So we do a bit of both. That's kind of our compromise solution, so that hopefully we can answer different types of questions. Yeah. Right, so the question is, is there any other way, like we can take blood to determine whether they're male or female, can we do that to determine age? And there is not. And that's the only way you can find if you determine if it's a male or a female? So actually, with, if, you, if they're standing next to each other, so on average the males are bigger, but there are big females and there are small males. So if you get a really big bird, like we take measurements on them, especially we measure their heads, and if you get a big blocky headed gull, you know that's a male. If you get this really cute, diminutive little head, that's a female. But then you get a lot that are in the middle that's like, I don't know, that's a regular head bird. We can't tell. So the only absolutely reliable way is to do the DNA, um, unless it's an extreme. Yep. Do you worry about when you ban the babies that when they grow, that the band will cut off circulation in the legs? Or that's a really good question. So it's about when we put the bands on the youngsters, they're not full size. So are we concerned that the bands we're placing are going to constrict the leg and cause problems? And one of the things that keeps us up at night is like, is something bad going to happen to this bird because of something that I put on it? So what we do with the young ones is um, right now we have interns out on the island and they're studying the birds and they have to keep track of like who hatched first. So we have these little temporary plastic poultry bands that we put on the birds when they're very small. 
And surprisingly, they're funny because they look really cute and fuzzy, but their legs reach full size kind of before the rest of them. So they're this, like a cartoony Muppet kind of thing going on. So we won't actually place these permanent bands until July when they are right on the brink of being able to leave. Like some of them, we wait so long with some of them that as we're chasing them to catch them, they're like, now I can fly. <laughs> and we're like, goodbye. So we try to make sure that they're fully set. And there are cases where we'll go to band a youngster and we'll just look at each other and be like, I don't think this leg is big enough. So we won't ever err on the side of getting our data if it means endangering the bird. Uh, because it's already, I mean, we don't see a lot of problems with these bands, but we're always worried they'll snag on something. Or And the main risk is when their legs are small, if you put the band on too soon, it'll slide over the foot. And then they'll just have this constricted foot. So we, we wait until we really have a sense that their legs are big enough. Um, all right, so this is kind of going to be pertinent to you guys, because if you're out and about and you get into looking for our banded birds, um, some of them you will see again and again and again. So Dave Adrian, again, has taken some of these pictures. Um, this is an example of a bird that we put a band on, and we never know how they're going to behave. That's why we put the bands on. So this bird, 2E2, um, has been seen a ridiculous number of times. This bird loves Plum Island. So if you ever want to see 2E2, you can go up to like the Salisbury sort of end of Plum Island. He kind of, he gets around a little bit. Um, and so you can see these photos are all taken by different people. So he's been seen by many, many people over and over again. And the really cool thing about this is like, we just ask people to tell us when they've seen the bird. So just, you know, send us a little form. This is, I saw 2E2 on this date at this location. But a lot of people are really great about sending us pictures. Um, and so we've realized, we didn't even mean to do this, but we're like, man, these pictures are a trove. Because it's like, in a lot of these cases, we can see what the bird has been eating. So you can see in one case, 2E2, 2E2 seems to be a bird who actually is a generalist. He will eat almost anything. So you can see in the upper right, he's got a pretty good sized clam. Um, the left one, where he looks a little dirty, his whole face is covered in blood because he had been like face deep in a seal carcass. So he will scavenge dead things. Um, we've seen him eating the whole fish. I don't remember what he's eating in the lower left one. I can't tell what that is. Um, and then the picture in the lower right, he's just like calmly going up, and he's going to go into this cooler. And the lump you see behind him with the towel over it, that's a person. <laughs> and so she was sitting under that towel, and it was a really hot day. I don't know why she was under the towel. But when she heard the rummaging, she thought it was her husband. So she took the towel off, and like the two of them like leapt apart, like, what? Like, <laughs> nobody expected to see anybody under those circumstances. So this bird, 2E2, will take advantage of anything that comes his way. So it does seem like he does live up to the idea of gulls are generalists. So like, they will, they will eat what becomes available. Not all gulls are like that. Others are like, no, I am a clam eating gull, and that's all I do. But 2E2 is very habituated to people, as you can see, and we'll eat almost anything. And the other cool thing about 2E2, actually I'll share it in a little bit, he's got a really cool family history um, that Dave actually has been a big part in helping us document about like multi-generational care of offspring that 2E2 does. So 2E2 is a male, he's like a super dad, he's like the most awesome. So he's one of my favorite birds. All right, let me see if this will work. 2E2 also prefers Starbucks to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> 2 e 2 is very sophisticated. He's not going to go to Dunkin' Donuts. He's definitely going to go to Starbucks every time. All right, and then so the opposite extreme. So 2 e 2 you can go visit 2 e 2 almost any day on Plum Island. Um, he is breeding on Appledore right now. He's got some babies, but he commutes. So he goes to Plum Island, gets some food, goes back to the babies. Um, and then we've got other gulls that are more like this. So we have many gulls that we have put a band on, and then we're like, great, it's got a band. We just got to sit back, and people are going to see it, and they're going to tell us where it went. And then we hear nothing, and years go by, and the bird comes back and breeds on Appledore every year, but that's the only time anybody ever sees it. So this, like, last year, we got a grant to be able to put um, loggers on the bird, so you can see this little backpack that this gull is wearing, so his head is up here in the bag, um, and then right, like, kind of right down by the butt, We've got this little GPS logger that's just attached by sort of like these Teflon shoelaces that go under its legs. They seem to tolerate them pretty well. Um, they adapt to them fairly readily. And once the bird then goes out wearing that thing, we can see exactly where it went. As long as it comes back to Appledore to kind of drop off its data, we know where it spent its time. And so that kind of solved, at least in part, this mystery of some of these birds that are never seen by humans. This bird is fishing. He's just offshore all the time. So whenever he's not on Appledore raising babies, I mean, there's a couple times where he goes into Portsmouth, I don't know, to get a coffee or whatever. But then the rest of the time, he's just out at sea. Now, that still raises questions for us. Is he following fishing vessels? Is he like getting lobster boat bait thrown to him? Or is he actually fishing? And this bird, we could study him a little more closely. Um, this is actually the bird that yacked up a full intact mackerel. 
So it's suggestive of this bird is going out and actually fishing for a living. Not to say he doesn't take advantage of fishing vessels if they go by, but that doesn't seem to be how he makes his living. Because when he does cough stuff up, it's pretty intact, like stuff that he caught himself. The ones that follow fishing vessels tend to yak up old bait, which is lovely. So this guy seems to be a fishing gull, and we wouldn't have known that without these GPS loggers. Unfortunately, they cost $1,000 a piece, and this past year, two of them never came back. The gulls just never came back. One of them was broken, and the other one was half broken. So I'm like, <laughs> it's like $6,000. I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Science is great. I love science. So, and then we, so we're kind of trying to put together multiple ways of finding out where these birds go. For those really elusive ones where we're like, nobody ever sees it. Well, let's use a GPS logger and see if we can find out. For the ones like 2E2, you don't need a GPS logger on 2E2. Everybody sees them every five minutes. And then sometimes we can, just by spreading the word more and more to more people, making them aware of like, oh, I saw a bird wearing a bracelet. Like, what's that about? <laughs> Most people that see our birds probably are just like, that was weird. There was a bird wearing a bracelet. I don't know what to make of that. But the more we can spread the word, the better. So the picture on the left um, was taken by Brad Natty. And he's actually a lobsterman. And he's really into the gulls. He's like, you know, sometimes being on a lobster boat is boring. And the gulls come, and they're funny to watch, and I like them. So he takes pictures of them for us, um, and he tells us where they are. And a lot of times when he reports a gull to us, no one has seen it anywhere but Appledore. So we're like, yeah, Brad, you're the only person who's ever seen that bird. And it seems like it must just be a bird that just follows fishing vessels, and that's how it makes its living. And most fishermen and lobstermen are not super fond of gulls, so they're not usually telling us. So Brad is a, is a rare gem for us who's interested in the science and wants to participate, and we We've gotten some of these great sightings from him of like a bird that now we know is doing fine, making a living out in the world that you know he has seen. And then sometimes you know, it's just we're like, I don't know why nobody saw that bird. So this bird, 9EE, was seen um, in Kennebunk, Maine, so just on the beach, you know, not the most common place you would go, like sort of an out of the way area. Um, and this reciter, Ken Janes, just happened to see it. And so he wrote into us, was like, I saw your bird. And we're like, You're the first person to ever see that bird since we banded it. And that had been like, I don't know six or seven years or something like that. So we don't know. Was that bird in Kennebunk the entire time? Who knows? So what we're trying to do is build more and more of an army of people that will see a bird wearing a bracelet and not be like, huh, weird, bracelet. They'll be like, the gulls of Appledore. I'm going to send that in right now. And we'll give you a full history. You'll get more information than you ever wanted about these gulls when you see them. Um, so we're looking more and more, thanks to our volunteer reciters who take pictures and report what they see, uh, because people don't just say, I saw this bird on this date. They tell us stories about them. You know, they'll say, this bird really looked very handsome, seemed very respected by other gulls, which I really love. I love that, like, kind of this governor wandering around. And then we got this picture of this charming couple. Um, they were on Plum Island as well. And so this, this woman, Kaya Walker, who's actually a scientist herself, she sent us a note that was like, here's my picture. And I saw these two birds, and they really were very close together. And they seemed to be sharing food, which girls don't really willingly do unless it's a family member. So that, that way we got information about not just that that was a pair for the year, but how early in the year they actually start pairing up. Because these birds were seen, I think, in March or April. And that's pretty far in advance of when they would actually be on the island. So they had kind of hooked up on Plum Island and were hanging out sharing clams. And we're like, pretty soon it'll be time to go to the island. Remember that romantic place? Um, the very sad thing is both of these birds died that year, which was like, really? Like they had this romantic interlude. And then so one of them, we don't know why. It just was found dead on Plum Island after just looking ill for several days. The other one got a fish hook in its mouth with monofilament attached, and we found it on Appledore, and the monofilament had wrapped around a shrub, so it was stuck there, and it just starved to death. So I was like, this is the saddest story. This is Romeo and Juliet all over again, except in herring gulls. So, but I mean, the advantage there is we rarely get that. We rarely get the whole life story. You know, we know a lot about these birds and who they paired up with and who their babies were, and then actually we know how they died, which I never like to see that, but to know how their stories end, is invaluable. And we wouldn't know these things about how they're pairing up and who they're hanging out with without volunteers who are willing to do more than just say, I saw Z09 on this date. They're willing to tell us what was going on. So if you do get involved, please don't ever feel silly for telling us a story. Because we're like, the stories. The stories is where the science is at. Like, it's generating more questions for us than we ever realized. They tend to stay when I was 
So that's a good question. So the question is, do they stay monogamous? And a lot of seabirds are known to pick a mate and kind of stick with it. We're finding that this is the common story with gulls. It depends on the individual. So we have some, 2E2 is one actually, who's been with the same mate for several years now and may actually have been with the same mate for many years. It's just we hadn't banded the mate before. So 2E2 may be one of those birds that's like a lifelong, like we, this is the good pairing, we raise good kids, this is it. We have other birds, we have one bird out on island we figured out this year, changes mates every year. Even if the mate from last year is around and is available, he's like, no thank you. I will take the younger model. So we don't know what governs that. We're like, why do some of them stick with the same mate and others choose not to? Um, sometimes they're forced to. So sometimes, you know, their usual mate, they'll like wait around and they're like, where is he? I'm here. I guess he's not here. And then they pick another mate. Um, and sometimes that mate from previous years will come back in a subsequent year and they'll switch back. So they'll have a different mate the year they were forced to. And then they're like, yeah, but I'd really ba rather go back to that other guy. So there's a lot of like fascinating stuff going on. And that's one of my big questions is how common, so they actually do call it divorce in the seabird world. How common is divorce and how often do they actually stick with each other? So this family is one example. So this is 2E2's family. Um, and What's cool about 2E2, 2E2 has stayed with the same mate for a long time, but also provides really extensive care to his babies. And so does his mate. So the whole family will hang out at Plum Island. So I encourage you to go there and visit 2E2's family. Um, 2AK is another bird you'll see at Plum Island. And that is one of 2E2's offspring from the prior year. And 2E2 was seen feeding him for like a prolonged period. Like usually they're like, all right, I did my part. I raised you. You can fly now. Buzz off. But we're seeing that certain gulls just are really invested in their babies. And for like over a year in some cases, they may not be actively feeding them, but they'll tolerate them being very close, which gulls don't usually do. So they're offering some measure of protection. And sometimes they are letting them share food. You know, they'll like be a little competitive about it, but then they'll be like, all right, come on in, have some of this fish. So that's not common to every single gull. So again, I can't say this is how gulls are. Gulls have individual personalities. And this 2E2 and his mate, 9ET, uh, are very committed to their babies. And it seems like they'll even tolerate like the teenagers from previous years hanging around when they have new offspring, which is really weird. Because usually it's like, look, I got new babies to feed. I can't be tolerating you near here. That the whole, the gang's all here on Plum Island. So you can see there, um, we've got 2E2 is across the water. Dave circled him in the picture. Um, and then 9ET, the mom, is with um, 6HJ. So that was their baby from that year. And 2AK is their baby from a previous year that still hangs out. So it's like having a 20-year-old living in your basement. That's 2E2. He's totally okay with that. So it seems to be pretty individualized. And then there's some other stuff, just like interesting little side notes that we're picking up from what volunteers are, are sending to us. And people just send us pictures along with their sightings. So these are two of Dave's pictures. And what we realized is there's a lot of stuff that's just not known about gulls. So there's some idea that as gulls get older, they go through a series of changes in their feathering. So they go from being kind of all gray and speckledy to the classic like black and white gull. And in those years intervening, they go through like a lot of different changes. So what you can see up top here is there's this black band on this tail here. And there's some people that suggest that that band will persist into like their fourth or fifth year, but you won't see it in a bird that's six. So that could be another way for us to get at like some of these ages on birds where we don't know their ages. So we realize like when people just happen to take cool pictures of the birds, we may be able to say other things about them. We're like, oh, we could go through our photo trove and say how many butt pictures do we have? and see like, all right, how old is that? Do we know how old that bird is? Can we confirm it? Um, and then we've got pictures here where like that's a nice clean white tail. So there's no butt stripe there. Uh, and then this like tiny text up here is just like a very well-known source on identifying seabirds that admits that like it's just not known. It basically says like, eh, maybe, but no one's really looked at it. So maybe somebody could study that. And we're like, yes, the volunteers for the gulls of Appledore are inadvertently studying this right now. So if you see a gull butt, Take a picture of it, because you never know how far that will go. And then another, like getting towards the end here of our mission, um, we want to do the science. We're fascinated by science. We have lots of questions about these gulls. You can't live among these gulls for as long as we have and not 
find them endearing and fascinating. But our dual mission is to get more students involved in this research, and especially students who would not have access to this kind of experience. So we now bring students out for short stints. We bring them out for week-long times to help us out with banding. And then we also have interns that live out there for 10 weeks at a time. Um, and we try to, yeah, it's an intense experience. Um, and we try to, I try at least, to select students from my home college, because community college students never get access to like field science. Um, and it's really strictly through the generosity of some incredible people that every year have put up the money to send these kids out here. And the interns do their own research study. They spend their whole summer studying something of interest to them that they can then present at a scientific conference or they can write up as a paper. So it's really an incomparable experience that we're able to offer them. And that's, that's probably the part I'm the most proud of. So when it comes down to what I'm asking you people in the room to do, I'm going to have Mary pass around the helmet as we're finishing up here and you know, have you guys ask questions. Um, we have a lot of different roles for people. As you can see, we rely very heavily on people out in the public seeing our birds and telling us about it. So you don't have to take pictures of them. If you just see it and you tell us what day you saw it and where you saw it, awesome. You never know. You may find a bird that nobody has seen in seven years. When you do report a bird to us, and I'll show you where and how to do that, um, you will get a full history. So you'll find out, like, you'll be like, wow, this is more than I ever needed. When was that bird banded? How old was it? Who were its siblings? Who were its mom and dad? Who have its mates been? So you'll get the whole shebang. And Mary handles all of that. So she will write you a whole story about that bird. Um, so that's one thing that you can do for free. Just when you're out and about, look for birds. Um, we do get them from Ipswich fairly commonly. We get them very commonly from the northern parts of Plum Island all the way up through Maine. And then on the off season in the winter, they go as far as Florida and Indiana and Texas. So you never know. Some of our birds spend their winter out on the Great Lakes. And they just live for 20, 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's remarkable. So we, we have one GPS tagged bird that, you know, finished up the breeding season on Appledore and raised his babies. And then as of August was like, I'm out of here and flew straight across, was like he took the mass pike and went straight out to the Great Lakes and spends his winter out there. Um, so yeah, they just, and they all have their individual preferences. So they all have their schedule like, okay, now it's time to head to Florida. And then 2E2 never leaves Plum Island. He spends the entire winter there raiding whatever he can find. So it's very individual to those birds. So you never know where they're going to turn up. So if you keep an eye out, and I'll show you the website where you can send your reports, that is awesome. Um, we also actually invite people to come out and join us for the banding. Um, Appledore is very accessible. It's a 45 minute to maybe an hour boat ride out of Portsmouth. And you can go for just a day trip, and they have full facilities there. They feed us very well. Full dining hall. Chef is amazing. And they'll feed you lunch. Um, so we do invite people to come out. Um, I think it's like 65 bucks to just visit for a day. And I have that number 150 there. That's if you stay overnight. And so people can do that. Um, I have money to help people who can't afford it on their own to come out and help us. But people who are like, yeah, I have 60 bucks or 150 bucks. I'd like to find out about it. You are most welcome. Appledore is open to the public. Um, you pay the Appledore Island people, not me specifically. Um, but if you do come out, when we're out there, we throw you right into as much as you want to do of the work. So if you want to run around chasing baby birds, you will do that. If you want to help us band an adult bird or try to trap it with that ridiculous box, you can help us with that. Um, so those are kind of the two opportunities for the public. Um, and then if you would rather give money rather than your time, we absolutely welcome money. Not that I'm looking for anybody to pony up $10,000 right now, but just to give you a sense of what it costs us to bring students out to the island to do this work and to get this experience. Um, we spend $10,000 just bringing out these crews to help us band each year. And then each intern we have for that 10-week stint is $5,000. So we've been unbelievably fortunate that people believe in this project and have sent us that money thus far. But whenever we do a talk like this, because we don't charge to do these talks, so we do just send around a hat. And if anybody wants to throw in a couple bucks, it goes to these groups. Um, and because, I mean, it's, I'm at a community college. We are not flush with resources, I can tell you that. And most of these, so a lot of the students that come out with us, um, some of them have, you know, they've lived in Lawrence their whole lives, which is not that far from the ocean, and they have never been to the ocean. They have never been on a boat. They have never been on an island. So we are showing them a lot of things for the very first time, and they do an amazing job. Um, so this is the slide I'm going to leave up while, if anybody has additional questions while I take those, because this is all of our contact information. Um, so I've got my email up there. I'm going to take that down. Um, 
We do have some social media presence. We're on Twitter fairly regularly. And then we keep a blog, so it functions as a website. Um, and you can go on there to report birds you've seen. Um, you can go on there just to see what we're up to. We just posted recently about what exactly are the interns studying out there. We'll share just stories of interesting birds and pictures and stuff like that. So you can check in there anytime. And that's also another way to reach us if you're interested. But um, I think with that, I mean, it, people have had pretty good questions so far. So if you have any additional ones, I am happy to field them. And if I can't handle them, then Mary can, because she's smarter than I am. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Three years back, we somehow contacted a few folks from the upper island. Yeah. We're from Appledore Island, and we went back to me every single year. Yeah. And I also have a herring gull that you can. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. We do this all the time. The bait I get, we have strips of meat for our fish. Yeah. Today. And all summer long, we do meat and birds. Yeah. And I see a mates, the bigger ones are males, the little ones are females. Yeah. They return every year on that boat. Yeah. And there is two big up black bags that seem to fight over the yes. smaller black bags. Yes. <laughs> so it was all, all summer long. Yeah. 45, yeah, yeah. It's I mean that's a perfect example. So that like, just to repeat for the people that are watching this on television. Um, that was like a first-hand report of a lobster boat where the same gulls are turning up looking for those handouts year on year. Um, and that's, we do see that. We've got a gull that goes out with the Seabrook fleet, follows those, like, there every morning. There's, like, follows the same boats. Those guys are like, yep, that bird is there every single day. So, I mean, they're no dummies, you know? They know, like, what side their bread is buttered on. But again, it's that same, you know, you don't see all of our gulls. It's that specific one that is making a living off of that boat. <laughs> Oh, That's awesome. I love that. I love these guys. <laughs> yeah. Going back to what's the main mortality cause of mortality? So that's a good question. So the question was about the fledglings and what's the main source of mortality for them. So it's it's a mix. Um, typically, these gulls lay three eggs, and they'll often hatch all three. So we refer to them as the A chick, the B chick, and the C chick, because they hatch in, or, so they don't all hatch on the same day. So you'll get the A chick is the first one out, B chick may the next day, C chick the third day. Um, and it's kind of the, the British monarchy model of the heir and the spare. So it's like the first one out has a pretty high likelihood of surviving. Um, I think the numbers were upward of 80% of them survive. By the time you get to that third one in the group, like under 20% of those guys are going to make it. So it's not that they are deliberately starved to death. It's just the parents have limited resources. So the parent will come back with a gullet full of fish or whatever they've been eating, and they yak it up on the ground, and then the babies come and feed. And the bigger you are, if you were the A chick, you are a little bigger than your siblings. So you're the first in. If you're the B chick, you're a little smaller, but you still have a chance. And a lot of times we'll see that little sea chick is just sort of like standing off at the edge. And they're often just too small and weak to compete. So for those younger ones, the sea chicks, it's usually just starvation. And even into the bee chicks, if the parents don't have enough provisions, they just, you know, the, the kind of the model is you're hopefully going to get one fledgling that survives out of your clutch that year. If you get two, you're lucky. It was probably a good year. Three is remarkable. So it kind of depends on that. And then there is some eating of babies by neighbors. I'm not going to deny that. Um, most of the time, that's because those once the fledglings are mobile, they will run into somebody else's territory. And when you do that, you are toast. <laughs> so sometimes they get killed by the neighbors. Um, people ask us a lot if the, if the adults will hunt the babies of their neighbors. We don't typically see that. Again, there's specialization. So we have had adult, like black backs especially, that will specialize on eating the babies of herring gulls which is a different species, so it's all fair in love and war. Um, so sometimes that's the case. So we wouldn't call that cannibalism, but sometimes you'll even get blackbacks feeding on their neighbor's blackback chicks. So there is some predation, uh, but I would say the main cause is starvation. I mean, would you agree, Mary? That's typically, and it's usually those second and third chicks. Let's just make a comment. 60 years ago, I made the mistake of going to Children's Island for a week. Hot <laughs> marble head. Uh -huh. The mortality right there was Counselors had free range. They found it was fun when they weren't working with kids to go out and beat fledglings to death. They gave eggs to any kid that wanted to take one home or a fledgling. Uh. I tried to organize a group 
proved to be the counter. Exactly. <laughs> Turnabout is fair play. <laughs> wow. I mean, that goes to their, you know, like some of these. Exa yeah, exactly. And I mean, we, we do still, I mean, we definitely are, are much more fortunate because we're located in this marine lab and it's this undergraduate, you know, college campus. And most of the people are there because they're interested in the natural world and they, you know, are striving to make it better. But you'd be surprised, like there have been faculty members out there that are not ornithologists. So they're not into birds. They're like studying invertebrates or something. And we have caught them hitting the gulls with sticks. So we're like, wow, there is some deep animus against these animals, and it's hard for us to understand. So, I mean, most of the time, like, the most we get is the students out there are often very unnerved, because you can get hit in the head, and it can be very intimidating. Um, but we do still deal with some of that really negative feeling. But that is, and then the other thing that people have pointed out is back in the 70s and before that, when the graph showed you how much higher the population was, it used to be a much more intense place to be. Like every time you'd need to go to the bathroom in the building next door, you had to run this gauntlet of these birds that were swooping on you all the time. And I think psychologically that's different, d difficult for people to deal with. Now it's a much lighter lift because there's just not that many of them. So that's probably part of why their reputation's sort of been rehabilitated. But <laughs> yep. Um, we used to have a seagull that visits us at the beach. Mm -hmm. Like every time you go. Yeah. Yep. But when you recognize her, she looks creepy. Mm-hmm. You can't figure out why she's the only one. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question was, there's a, a particular gull that some people have been seeing at the beach, and her feathers just look kind of greasy. Um, and we actually had, so my guess is she's feeding somewhere else, probably where there's a lot of handouts, potentially a restaurant, where there is discarded grease. Because we actually had a bunch of birds where we thought there had been an oil spill in Gloucester because a bunch of gulls just looked horrendous, like they looked greased and oiled. And it turned out that they had been behind a fish processing plant and there was a vat of fish oil and they just kept going into it. <laughs> they were just like completely greased up. So once we realized it was fish oil, I mean, they'll just preen it off of themselves and it wasn't like an actual petroleum product. So it may be that they're getting into waste. Yeah, so she's probably, because they do have these like typical, so she goes to the beach and she gets food handouts from people, she's probably running a circuit where there's some kind of, oh yeah, because she knows, she knows what's up. She's going to get snacks. Yeah, oh yeah, once they have a turf, they're like, no, no, you're not coming near. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's another stop on her circuit that is like a restaurant or some processing place where she's getting some fish and getting oiled. Yeah. <laughs> Any others? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I would go out and visit the Yeah. During World War II, they were bombing, they were practicing bombing on Appledore, yeah. and we could watch them playing. Oh, my God. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that, that story raises some, like, kind of not necessarily goal-related history about the islands, but it was about how in World War II, the Isles of Shoals was used as a practice range for dropping bombs. And... Actually, Duck Island, which is one of the Isles of Shoals, we're not allowed to set foot on it because there's a suspicion that there's still unexploded ordnance. <laughs> so there's a cormorant colony there. So people are often like, oh, can we go study the cormorants? They're so cool. And we're like, mm, if you want to blow up. So like, we don't, we frown on that. So we don't go there. But yeah, I mean, and the, Appledore has this like big giant radar tower on it from like scanning for submarines. So there's some really cool, we tend to be very focused on the gulls. But if you do ever get a chance to come out there, there's some amazing archaeology and just human history that's gone on out there that's that's pretty incredible. Yeah. All right. Oh, that means it's time. I'm turning into a pumpkin. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful crowd. I just want to remind people and let you know Sarah has come down from New Hampshire. She's presented this free of charge. So if you have an extra five, ten dollars in your purse in your wallet and you'd like to put that in the um, hat that just was passed around, that would be really um, worthwhile putting it to that. Um, the Conservation Commission wants to thank Sarah for coming down and her sister Mary. We do provide many services for our town and one of them is education on different environmental issues. If you have something you would like to hear about at a presentation or if you know someone, please get in touch with the Conservation Commission. We would love to have that person and that presentation here. Again, thank you for coming tonight, and Sarah will be out around here for a couple more minutes if you'd like to talk to her.
Thank you, everyone.